Hello, it's Peter Wright and Kathleen Beauvais in Ontario, Canada, with episode number 64 of The Yacking Show. This is where we talk about life, business and more, and we bring you tips and ideas for the changing world we're living in. We always have interesting guests. Today will be no exception, but first I must welcome Kathleen and she will introduce our guests. So, hi Kathleen, good to be back and on the show with you again. Did you get blown away yesterday? That <laughs> gale force wind? <laughs> yeah, well, almost, almost. It is a, a kind of a nasty, it was really nasty yesterday and today is really gloomy again. So, yeah. We're staying tucked inside today. So thank you for the That's interview right. and thank all of you for joining us. We so appreciate you. And of course, we'd love to read your comments. So do please keep them coming. And of course, if anyone out there is interested in being a guest on our show, please don't hesitate to reach out to either Peter or myself. And uh, also we would really appreciate it if you could like or subscribe to our YouTube channel. That would make our day. So thank you for yes. that. And yes, as Peter said, we do have another special guest with us today. Her name is, and I hope I get this right, Tanya Zaboro. Tanya, almost. Tanya. <laughs> Tanya. <laughs> so, Hi, guys. Thank, uh, hello, Tanya. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. I'm good. Yep. Just uh, trying to stay dry myself. I think it'll be an indoor day. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for joining us today, and uh, you have an interesting yeah. background, which we'll get to in a moment. But you are the owner and founder of TBT Clinic Medical and Aesthetics, and yeah. you specialize in bio-identical hormone uh, therapy, and we want to do the show about that today, which is so fascinating to us and why it's so important. So welcome, and maybe perhaps you can go and tell our listeners about your background and what led you into this focus, into this specialty. Um, okay, yeah, thanks, Kathleen. So I'm a nurse practitioner. I've been a registered nurse for just over 20 years now, um, and uh, I did a lot of work up uh, on the on the reserves in the north um, of Canada, in Ontario and Manitoba and Nunavut. Um, and then while I was at home, I worked in Emerge. And then about 10 years ago, I got into doing aesthetics. So injections of Botox and filler and things like that for medical as well as cosmetic reasons. And it was when I went back um, to school in 2013 to do my nurse practitioner and get that license, that I really saw in primary care um, how hormonal imbalances and depletions were not handled very well. And there really wasn't a lot of resources for people uh, to go to. And I thought that that would be something that I really wanted to incorporate into my practice. I thought not only does it fit well with what I do, um, but it's just a really important aspect of primary care that is really overlooked for a lot of people. Okay. So I, I got a question for you, Tonya. Um, sure. A lot of, lot of people don't take the idea of hormones seriously. They'll sort of say, ah, it must be my hormones, I'm getting old or whatever. So tell us, tell our viewers and listeners why, why they are important. And, and perhaps you can dispel something of a misconception I might have. I've always thought hormone levels naturally decrease with age. So I've given you two questions in one, but yeah, that's okay, Peter. Well, obviously they do decrease with age, um, but doesn't necessarily mean they ought to or that we want them to. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have a lot of organs that produce our hormones. Um, we have our pancreas, our thyroid, our adrenals, our ovaries, testicles, all of those kinds of things. And as they get older, they produce less hormones. So seeing that hormones are, in, are responsible for controlling all of the actions in our body, it stands to reason that we would want those as optimal to function as long as we can in our, in our age, right? So um, BHRT, bioidentical hormone replacement therapy, allows us to keep those levels up as we get older and to do it safely. Um, you know, I, I, yeah, people think, oh, hormones are not necessarily that important. Well, they're, they're going, they're doing this, they're doing that. 
but all of our systems, our endocrine system, that's our hormonal system, our immune system, our nervous system, they all communicate together to keep our body in balance. And, you know, a, a very small hormonal deficiency can really change that. Mm. And so can you tell our, our listeners a little bit about some of the signs that your hormone levels may be out of whack? Yeah. Because I well, know that you, when you yes. get testing done, um, and you know, the conventional testing will have a range that may be from here to here. And if you fall within that range, they consider it normal. But then as an expert in this, you kind of see it differently. So if somebody may be low normal here, but high normal here, and they're reporting to you that they're not feeling great, that tells you, a, a, a basically gives you a storyboard about what may be going on with them, correct? Right. Well, so that's kind of a, a double sort of area. So as far as signs and things that you would experience, I mean, obviously we all know the typical, oh, this woman, she's hormonal, right? She's, she's getting, can I say bitchy? Um, mm -hmm. Right. You know, moody and night sweats and hot flashes and vaginal dryness and painful intercourse and those are the things that people know and those are the things that are sort of cliched as a hormonal imbalance, right? Mm -hmm. When you're getting premenopausal or into menopause. But you know what? The hormones do everything. You start to notice, you know, with men, a lack of libido, a lack of bone mass, a lack of, um, you know, more, a lack of energy, more fatigue, uh, more weight gain, especially around the middle. Um, Issues with sleep, having a harder time getting to sleep and staying to sleep. Your mood, you, you have, um, you just have a less confidence, less sense of well-being um, that you used to have. Um, you know, there's all kinds of signs, you know, mental kind of fog, lack of concentration, lack of memory. Those are all issues that are, that happen with quote, normal depletion of hormones as you get older. But there's also a lot of other things that um, we could look at. For instance, you have a woman who's 35 years old and she had to get a hysterectomy. Um, and then nobody does anything to replace her hormones. Well, that's not normal for someone who's 35 to have her ovaries removed and have no replacement of her hormone, her, her reproductive sexual hormones. And so she goes into an instant menopause. Um, hormonal imbalances or what also are factors with things like diabetes and all kinds of other illnesses. Um, you know, with men, you know, men are not accustomed to hormonal changes throughout their lives and fluctuations like women are. So as women, we're used to that, unfortunately. And some women suffer more from their monthly hormones shifting more than others. And so they were accustomed to the fact that our hormones are going to change. And for men, they're, they're more fortunate. They, they tend to have this nice high hormone level. And then all of a sudden they get to an age and it's like, it just drops off. And it seems like to themselves and to their partners that almost overnight they've become that crotchety dotty old man. Um, there's another thing, uh, very, very common. Uh, it's called polycystic ovarian syndrome, or what we refer to it as PCOS. And approximately 10% of North American women have that. And it's a horrible thing, and it's really not very well treated. Um, people come because they've been sometimes looking for help for decades. And so basically what happens is they have an overgrowth of tissue and cysts around their ovaries, um, it's usually linked to uh, high levels of insulin. They have issues with a lot of weight gain. They can't seem to lose the weight no matter what they do. You know, and they're told just to exercise more, watch what they're eating. They get that increase, they get facial hair where they shouldn't. Um, they get thinning hair on their head, it's acne. It's a very classic look. Um, and that, that, you know, people need help dealing with that because for young women who have that, it's, it's a really hard, stressful thing for them to go through, not to mention the infertility issues that often come with it. So there are a lot of different signs that would lead to the fact that your hormones may be depleted or out of balance. And as far as lab work goes, Kathleen, mm -hmm. um, yes, we have that, uh, you know, 
range that we use and lab results are a part of a proper BHRT regimen. Um, but it's important to treat the patient and not the lab results because lab results provide a range or an average based on a specific demographic, but what's low or normal or high on, on a certain lab value doesn't necessarily translate to an optimal hormone level for a specific person. Um, there's many factors that are involved in our hormone functioning, not just what's the level, but what are our receptors like? Are our receptors sensitive to the hormones? Are they insensitive? What is the signaling system like? Is it working well? Lab, lab, lab values don't, you know, tell you anything about that. And then, of course, here's something that may actually be a, a good topic for a whole other podcast, but there's a lot of endocrine disrupting compounds in our environment. And I don't know if that's something that is that a familiar term to mm -hmm. either of you? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. right. you know, I'm familiar a little bit uh, on this topic, but by all means, delve into it because there are certain foods that mimic like soy. Right. So, you know, the food industry, it, again, the food industry is an industry, right? And it's there to make money. So a lot of the, the preservatives and chemicals and, and things that are in foods, food storage, bottles, containers, um, personal care products. Uh, when it says fragrances, just fragrances, those are usually endocrine disrupting compounds. Mm -hmm. And they are most often some sort of an analog or a type of estrogen. Well, those compete with our own um, estrogens or other hormones and they're very, very strong. They're synthetic. They're not identical to our own. And very often they win out um, and cause a lot of damage. And sometimes the lab values are picking up the endocrine disrupting compounds. So our level may say that it's normal, but it may, our true level of our own bioidentical thyroid molecule or estrogen molecule, which is estradiol or progesterone molecule could be depleted, but these, these, uh, synthetic analogs are are competing and showing that the level is okay. So okay. there there are a couple hormones that as I get involved on a, a regimen with people that are important, that they're at least at a minimum level. But other than that, um, it's like I said, again, it's really important to go with the clinical symptoms and treat the patient and mm. not the number. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. So, <clears throat> Apart, apart from the obvious uh, male-female type hormones, do, yes. do men and women experience hormone imbalance differently for, say, uh, adrenal or thyroid-generated hormones, or, or are um, they similar? They're very similar, um, and yet they're not only di different uh, across the gen or between the two genders, or, well, I guess there's more genders now, but I don't get into that because that's even more complicated. Uh, as far as treating, it really is. Sure. So, um, but across individuals, there's a lot of different ways okay. that those things are expressed. So, you know, like I said, men generally will experience uh, a decrease in libido, a decrease in sexual function, um, a decrease in um, erection strength and ability to keep, to keep the erection, um, a drop in their mood, a drop in their confidence, increase belly fat that they can't get rid of, decrease in strength. Women will experience those as well. Um, but again, there's so many aspects that we overlap with, but we, we differ with. Those are sort of the basics that you would say. But as far as thyroid goes, yes, low mood, um, mental focus, lack of mental focus, communication, many different, many different similarities and many different differences. I, I'm sorry that I can't really answer that um, succinctly with this or no, or it's either this or it's that, but, but it isn't. And, and I think that's just as an attestment to why um, this can be so complicated and why it's not really dealt with very well in primary care. Okay, no, I think you answered it very well. Sorry, Kathleen, okay. over to you. Okay, <laughs> um, So perhaps, Let's explain yeah. what exactly is bioidentical hormone replacement therapy and what would 
a patient, what, what experience would somebody coming to you um, with some issues, what, what would their experience be in terms of what they're sent for lab work, for the assessment and all of that? So nowadays, especially with COVID, um, it's something that I can do with FaceTime or over the phone. Um, if somebody's particularly complicated, I do like them to come into the clinic uh, the first time. I do have a lot of patients that are way out of my area uh, logistically. So we, you know, having this type of technology that for instance, we're using today is perfect. So it starts with an assessment um, and I do a thorough medical history um, consult with the patient, um, go through um, an assessment of their different types of symptoms. And I use a form where um, I have a scale so it's important for me to quantify some of these mm -hmm. issues and symptoms on a scale of one to 10 or one to five, because this way we have something measurable that we know that we're improving from one um, appointment to the next. Mm -hmm. So once we do that, um, then I send them off with or email them their lab requisition um, and they get their blood work done. Once I review that, then uh, we have our follow-up appointment, discuss it, decide on the treatment plan, and then I send their prescription out. And if they're local to me in Kitchener, um, I use Greenbrook Pharmacy, which is a good compounding pharmacy, and especially one of the pharmacists there, Nick Beamish, um, He's very experienced in, in compounding um, hormones. And for anybody out of town, I use uh, Trutina, which is, I think, the largest, if not one of the largest compounding pharmacies in Canada. They're located in Ancaster, and they don't have a storefront. So they deliver free everywhere in Canada. So, and then I ask for a minimum of four um, well, I guess three more follow-ups for the first year. So I like to do some blood work and do a follow-up every three months, um, adjust the hormones as needed. Mm -hmm. And usually after about a year, some people, well, I should say, usually at, at a year, people are fairly, um, I'm sorry, I've lost, uh, lost the word. Uh, the, the, the dosing is pretty set. We've got good levels, we've got good symptom control, and then we continue with that dosing. Uh, and then they don't need a follow-up every three months. It's, it can be as, as minimal as once a year. Some people like to do it twice a year, every six months. Um, of course, if there's health changes or anything like that, we can follow up more often. But it's really in that first year while we're getting them on that journey to optimal hormone levels that I, I like to see them three to four times. Mm -hmm. And so what exactly is, is the, is it a, is it a pill? Is it like a supplement that is? A, um, is sometimes it's a pill. Uh, people who may have heard of um, bioidentical hormone replacement therapy or BHRT through naturopaths, they may, um, they may be accustomed to creams. Mm -hmm. And there's times that I do use creams, but most of the time I like to use pills or injections and then sometimes it is a cream. It depends on the person. It depends on what um, symptoms we're trying to deal with because both men and women get different levels, different experiences, whether it's a pill or a cream or an injection. Again, that's another thing that makes things so complicated and that it's really important that it's a very, very uh, individual treatment tailored to the specific needs of each patient. Does that answer that well enough for you? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. For me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I have a lot of different uh, abilities. Um, some people may have heard of pellets. I yep. don't use pellets. Now, pellets are not um, approved yet in Canada, but a lot of people I've heard of will go down to the States and get their pellets. So these are small implanted devices that release the hormone. Mm -hmm. The problem with doing that is one of the people, what people don't often realize is, yes, it's convenient, doesn't mean it's always better and safe. Um, it may be at some point, but if somebody is, you know, remember when I mentioned that it can take some months to get somebody 
dosing perfect yeah. for them. So if I put a pellet in there at the beginning when I'm treating them with a dose and it's too much, mm -hmm. they're stuck, right? Yeah. I can't go in there and dig that pellet out. So, you know, people should look beyond just, oh, this is great, this is convenient, and start to Google some of the pellet hormone lawsuits in the States. Really? Um, yeah, so it is a tool and I may use it down the road when it becomes allowed, but definitely not when I'm starting out with somebody. It's important to be able to change the dosing very quickly mm -hmm. um, when we're beginning their treatment. Oh, and, wow. and Kathleen, I think you mentioned a couple minutes ago, you said really what is bioidentical? So um, hormone replacement therapy, when I said that it's not dealt with very well in primary care, in the early 2000s, there were a couple of hormone studies done and, you know, there was shown to be, uh, there was 10,000 patients in this study, the Women Health Initiative, and it was a very poor study. Um, they're seeing that now. They're, they're even going on to stories of people that worked on the study that left um, with, you know, because there were biases, there were agendas, there were the organization of the study, people were just randomly put into things. There was no baseline control of what was going on, who had what already, did this person have heart disease, didn't they? They were using synthetic hormones, so mm -hmm. synthetic progestins, which have, which have been shown to be very harmful. They were using synthetic estrogens, which on their own haven't been shown to cause the same amount of harm. But out of 10,000 people, 30 people had problems and so they everyone just dropped hormone therapy like a hot potato mm -hmm. women that were on this synthetic estrogen were just dropped their doctors discontinued it and they were just left that way and nobody wanted to pick things back up again mm -hmm. but in all of the reputable journals like cardiology new england journal of medicine the lancet uh, journal journal of clinical endocrinology all of these journals have a lot of great research for years showing the benefit of what happens when you give bioidentical hormones. And so bioidentical means that it's not synthetic. It may be synthesized from something. It may have to be manufactured. But the end result mm -hmm. is that the molecule of the hormone is bio, biologically identical to our own. And that what, that's what makes it safe. And that's the difference. And, you know, I know um, a lot of people have not heard about it and they think, and they may ask, well, why haven't I heard about it? Um, and the reason is, you know, the short answer, unfortunately, is that politics and economics are just as alive and well in medicine and healthcare as they are anywhere. Um, you know, the medical model is very complicated and, especially for a general practitioner, you have to know a lot about a lot of different systems. And so in order to make things easier for us, you know, there's a lot of different associations like um, Heart and Stroke Association and Cancer, uh, Can Cancer Ontario and all of those different associations. And they um, publish guidelines that basically take all of that information and succinctly break it down into algorithms um, for us to follow uh, when we're when we're treating certain conditions like blood pressure and you know you have all your first line treatments and so it's a good diagnostic and treatment plan tool for practitioners but the problem is is these associations are either funded wholly or in part by pharmaceutical companies and pharmaceutical companies i mean we need them they are, we can't just look at them as the big bad monsters that everybody likes to say, because without them, we wouldn't have a lot of medications that we need. We wouldn't have these up and coming vaccines that are, are getting ready for COVID, for example. But pharmaceutical companies need to patent something in order to make money, because it, it's hundreds of millions of dollars to bring a medication or something mm -hmm. to the market. And so you can't really patent something that's a naturally occurring molecule unless you do something 
to adulterate it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So for instance, it would be like patent, trying to patent oxygen. Mm -hmm. You can't patent that, right? It's available for everybody. So there's just not the kind of research into bioidentical hormones. And, and, there, and then again, the science is not taught in medical schools because again, the pharmaceutical companies are very involved in delivering the medical model and that begins in medical schools. So unless your doctor did their own personal research, they likely just wouldn't know about it and they wouldn't understand it to the level that you need to in order to practice and, and provide it to patients. So in other words, <clears throat> to my doctor, I'm sorry, Peter, I I'm just- No, no, carry on. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I... <laughs> so in other words, if I were to go to my doctor, and ask for a hormone um, test. Um, I I have actually done that and and got a no. Um, yeah. And why is that really? Well, and there. Well, that's another part of right when doctors and you know we have to be understanding that they don't know what they don't know, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And what they what they do know is that we are as general practitioners or any practitioner, we are encouraged and it is strongly advised that we um, only order things that will change our treatment of the patient so a lot of times somebody will say no i'm not going to order that for you because it's not going to change their course of action with you they're not going to do anything about it so they're not going to order it and when it comes down to things like hormones especially if you've ever had a test done anybody listening that's ever had a test done and access their own labs online, you can see that, you know, you've got little luteal phase, follicle, all these different phases and the numbers are different. So one of the other reasons that they won't check your levels is because they don't necessarily know how to interpret the result. Right, okay. Tonya, I, I do have another question for you, which yes. is something uh, that just occurred to me, but we're, we're getting towards the end of our time. So I want to give you the okay. chance to tell our, our listeners and our viewers how they can contact you. Um, well, the, you know what? My, my clinic, as you said, is TBT, so Tango Bravo, Bravo Tango Medical and Aesthetics. My website is tbtclinic.com. Got it. The phone... Did you get that, Peter? Sorry. Yep, yep, okay. got it. And the phone number is 519. Yep. 741. Yep. 5933. Okay. They can also email me um, info at tbtclinic.com. Okay. And they can also find me on Facebook and Instagram, and I can give you that. Um, Give me that afterwards and I can put it on. Yeah. 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 So I, I want to, that's great. We'll, we'll have captions there for our viewers. So okay. you can, addressing our audience, you can look back and pick it up and at the beginning and end of this video. My quick okay. question is, um, yes. and I'm not necessarily talking about myself here, just to dispel yeah. any rumors to the contrary, but <laughs> uh, very often men of my sort of gray bearded age, have problems and you know what I'm talking about and they head off to the doctor and they prescribe Viagra for instance or, or one of the yes. others. Is, yes. is that the safer option or should they be coming to someone like you and looking at the hormone idea well, first? Well, Peter, um, I don't necessarily prescribe the little blue pill very often but I do prescribe the little white one. So um, I often will provide, and the reason it, that I don't do Viagra as opposed to um, Cialis, those are the brand names, mm -hmm. is because with Viagra, um, it causes vasodilation. So it, yep. it, there, so a lot more blood can move in to the area for the erection. However, it also causes a vasodilation of the coronary arteries. So sometimes for people um, that can cause issues if they have heart, underlying heart problems. So I, um, I often do them in tandem because it does take some time to get testosterone levels back up to mm -hmm. alpha male, strong Viking warrior levels uh, where you're feeling good and functioning, uh, functioning optimally. And during that time, you know, you want to address that issue. Not only that, Peter, sure. but I, I think everybody knows and any woman or man listening to this who's gone through erectile dysfunction with somebody there's a huge mental component to it sure, and once imagine, you, yeah. once you experience 
things not working time and time and time again, you are set to be anxious about it and you're set to feel uncomfortable. And so providing the uh, physical aid with the erectile, this, you know, with the medication helps it be kind of a sure thing um, while that journey uh, to getting their testosterone increased and back to optimal happens. So I often Good. prescribe that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'm sure that'll, that, that'll encourage a lot of guys watching this video. I'm right. sure. Thanks. Absolutely. And I, <clears throat> we're, we're out of time. So for me, thank you, Tonya. Okay. I'm going to hand back to Kathleen to do her wonderful summing up and ending of our show. Over to you, Kathleen. Thanks, guys. Yes, thank you so much. That Thanks was for so having me. We'd love to have you back at some point. Sure. And uh, thank you all for tuning in and joining us. And as I mentioned before, we so enjoy your comments. We love reading them. Please keep them coming. And if anyone out there is interested in becoming a guest on our show, please don't hesitate to reach out to either Peter or myself. And once again, if you would please subscribe to our YouTube channel, you would make our day. So thank you. Until next time, stay safe. Bye-bye.